Saturday, November the 9th, 2013, the Philippines woke up to this. An apocalyptic landscape. Millions homeless, lives shattered. Over 5,000 dead. So many died because of the water. We never consider the storm surge and the destruction that it will bring us. So that was the mistake. This is the inside story of Typhoon Haiyan. From those who felt its devastating force. We did not expect that there will be a, a flood that will be coming. And those still battling to deal with the aftermath. And I realized that they weren't fishing, they were pulling dead bodies from the water, and lots of them were children. That staff sergeant right there, tell them we need as many people as we can to offload the C-130. It's devastated, really, especially up the coast towards Tacloban. Just everything around flattened. It's also the extraordinary story of the science behind one of the world's deadliest storms. It was a monster storm. This actually went off the scale. Typhoon Haiyan is going to go into the record books as probably the most powerful cyclone to ever make landfall. Saturday, November the 2nd, the story of Typhoon Haiyan begins. Six days before striking land, it appears as a low pressure area in the Pacific. Slowly but surely, it's heading for the Philippines. Despite the gathering storm, people on the ground are calm. It was not an alarming thing for us. We've been used to typhoon, and so it was not something extraordinary to be worried about. Everything was just so normal. I mean, day-to-day -day operation of the grocery, and so people were buying, but they're not in panic and buying things because we are so used with the typhoon. For five days as it crosses the sea, the typhoon gathers intensity. As early as November 3rd, this was looking very serious. It looked like it was going to have a potential to be a very classic monster-sized typhoon. Most of the models suggested it would be a very intense storm. The track was very well forecast. As the days went by, it became very apparent that this was going to blossom into a super typhoon, which of course it did. Finally, at 4.40 a.m. on the morning of Friday, November the 8th, Typhoon Haiyan reaches land at Giwan on the east coast of the Philippines and unleashes hell. A typhoon, which has been predicted to be the strongest tropical cyclone ever recorded, has made landfall in the Philippines. The U.S. Navy's Typhoon Warning Center had been predicting sustained winds of 195 miles an hour. Roof flying and some things that are flying, which is an unbelievable thing, like motorbikes flying, even air conditioning units. With a massive storm breaking around her, Carmelita Bantalan, who's heavily pregnant, is terrified. Yung mga bubong, nagkakandalipad. Sa kaya ako, takot na takot rin, takot na takot na takot rin ako. Nasira na to nung alas 5 ng umaga. Also in Giwan, Carlito Arias struggles to protect his five children. Dito kami nagtago nung sira na yung bahay, bahay namin. Tinatapig-tapig ko sila. Tinatawag ko yung mga pangalan nila. Sabi ko, Sara, anoin mo si Precious, yung maliit niya na bebe. Tsaka dito naman si Cristel, dito naman si Liza. Dito si Jamaica, si Maripi, at saka si Aaron, si Angel, nandiyan. Iniipit ko sila ng pagganon. With the storm smashing against him, Carlito tries to push his children to safety. Pagano nito muna yung tubig. Tayo, tayo! May tubig! 
hanggang favorito yung tubig. Along kasi yun eh. Hindi lang diro-diretso na baha. Alon kasi bigla. Una dito, tapos umalon hanggang dito. Tapos umalon naman dito hanggang sa nalubog na ako. Kasi may hinahawakan kasi dito eh. Nahawakan ako ng unang yung tuhod ko, hindi na natutulog ng asawa ko, hindi na mapakali. Tinanong niya ako, ano, kaya mo? Nadaling kita sa ospital. Carmelita is in pain. She's about to give birth in the middle of a typhoon. The people of Giwan are locked in a life and death struggle against the elements. And Typhoon Haiyan shows no sign of weakening. As Haiyan approached land, the forecasters got better data from satellites that became very clear that this is a storm of unusual intensity. We can see the counterclockwise rotation, and this is where the storm is most intense, right around the eye. The outer bands of the storm, they're packing a bit of a punch as well. Friday, November the 8th, 7 a.m. Around two hours after first hitting land, Typhoon Haiyan's destructive force reaches its climax as it smashes into Tacloban City, home to over 200,000 people. Our house was already shaking as if the wind is going to uproot the house. And I saw the windows already gone and uh, wind coming inside with a mist of water and it's all white. It's all white, circling. At the hospital, one of the nurses, Paolo Pardilla, tries to move his patients to safety. We instructed our patients to get out of their rooms and to slowly to be on the basement where we think at that time was safe for us. We place our patients here only with their, with their IV, with their intravenous fluids. So here they pile up here. Now the typhoon plays its most deadly card, unleashing a storm surge against the city. This is just like a 15-foot high tsunami. The storm peaked right as it was going ashore in the Philippines. That's the tragedy. This actually went off the scale. It was a monster storm, a textbook example of a classically strong super typhoon. This was a terrifying storm. Without knowing it, Paolo and his team are moving patients down and into danger. They have no idea the water is so close. The first water was up to here, clear, clear, here only, clear water. Then after that, we see uh, the, the surge, the, the wind and, the, and uh, the flood, which was up to here that was thick as the, the color was black, blackish water was, uh, was coming. We tried to assist our patients and to, to get at the second floor to get up so that we will be saved. While Paolo tries to move his patients to safety, a priest, Father Hector Villamil, provides refuge in his church moments before the surge swamps the ground floor. This is where the water came in, coming, rushing towards us because behind that house or that building with a blue roof, that's already water, that's already Pacific Ocean. People face an agonizing dilemma. Rising water floods ground floors, but with terrifying winds tearing roofs apart, escaping to an upper floor is far from a safe option. And I said, okay, I cannot go up and take refuge, but I cannot go down anymore because of the water was rising up here. So that's the thing. It's either the water or the wind. It's almost like the devil and a deep blue sea. Every typhoon brings flooding, but the deluge brought by Haiyan is on the scale of a tsunami. The storm surge simply sweeps away weak buildings. In the worst areas, flood water is 20 feet deep. If you see that statue of St. Joseph, yeah. where the baby Jesus, the head and the waist, that's how deep the water is during the, the typhoon. 
the water was so sudden. It came so sudden. My children were crying. They were all, they were in panic. Everything floated like a paper. The refrigerator, the, the divider, the, the flat screen TV and everything. It floated like a paper. It's okay if it was only strong winds. But because of the water, so many died because of the water. Typhoon Haiyan struck the Philippines on the 8th of November, 2013. Its victims were accustomed to dealing with tropical storms and high winds, but the huge wave of water unleashed by this typhoon was completely unprecedented. We never consider the storm surge. Even the forecaster, if I'm not mistaken, never mentioned about the storm surge and the destruction that it will bring us. At its height, the storm surge water was around 20 feet deep. All too quickly, the city of Tacloban was submerged. The old and infirm were rescued with makeshift rafts. Hospital nurse Paolo used floating mattresses to get his patients to safety. This is the level of the water. Up to here, the patient was floating. We slowly assist the patient in the hospital bed. There is a gushing of wind. There is a strong current of the water. The other patients were terrified, were in panic, and we assist the, the patients to be in that bed. The bed was to slowly carry the patient up to here so that we can have rescued here. The storm surge swept rapidly through the city, smashing through everything in its path. For Georgina Bulasa and her family, there was only one way to survive, swim for it. So we managed to swim from here to this place. It was so fortunate that this one was destroyed. We were able to, to get inside. And the owner of this apartment was so kind that he let us in because he was, he was able to see us already swimming and, and shouting for help. This, this car is uh, the car of our neighbor. When we get inside, we immediately go up. Georgina was one of the lucky ones. It's really scary and now I cannot imagine that I, my, my, my family lives. We survived because you know what? Our neighbors died, families by families. <laughs> For scientists watching around the world, Typhoon Haiyan was the perfect storm. Its speed, its power and the storm surge, a tsunami-like wave, all reached their peak at the moment Haiyan hit the Philippines. Tropical storms be they called hurricanes, cyclones, or typhoons, depending on which ocean basin you're in, are, are independent storms, if you will. They, they start over warm ocean waters. That is the fuel for these storms. Typhoons form when water evaporates from the warm ocean. With no crosswinds to break it up, the moisture rises and condenses into clusters of thunderstorms. Typhoon Haiyan formed over the warmest waters on the planet. 
It's called the warm pool over Micronesia and Malaysia. Now here the water late in the season is very warm. It's about 30 degrees Celsius. So we had a lot of energy in that ocean for it to draw on. Additionally, there weren't any winds tearing it apart. It was in a very nice, quiet zone of air, so it could create its own environment and spin up to become this perfect storm. Just days away from reaching land, the conditions were perfect for Haiyan to turn from a typhoon into a once-in-a-lifetime super typhoon. Right now, it's as big and as mean as a cyclone can actually probably get on this planet. There's no real land mass for it to bring in drier air, so this storm is going to just continue to strengthen and roll through the Philippines with incredible strength. Haiyan measured 380 miles across, and with estimated wind speeds of up to 195 miles per hour, they would be the fastest ever recorded for a typhoon hitting land. The wind speeds themselves were as if you had a moderate to strong tornado coming through. Tornadoes pass over in a minute or two. These winds were blowing for an hour or two in some locations. Such a sustained bombardment was bound to bring death and destruction. But some other consequences were more surprising. The typhoon was not the only instance of nature taking its course on the morning of November the 8th. Across the islands, many pregnant women were shocked into giving birth. The hospitals could do little to help. For six hours while the storm raged, expectant mother Carmelita had been in labor, sheltering with her family in the ruins of her home her pain intensifying by the minute. Yung mga bubong nagkakandalipad. <laughs> Saka ako, takot na takot rin, takot na takot na takot rin ako. Finally, her moment had come. Sabi ko, parang hindi ko na kaya. Eh, nung umupo ako, yun, umano ng ano ko, tumutubo. With no access to professional help, Carmelita is in the hands of her family. Pagkatapos, sabi ko, higa ako, hawakan mo yung tuhod ko. Kasi yung ano ko, nung asawa ng uncle ko, hindi niya kaya hawakan ng tuhod ko kasi nanginginig daw siya. Ang asawa ko nung pinahawak ko ng tuhod ko. Solbar na yung, nasurvive na yung Ano yung baby, tsaka pati ako. In the immediate aftermath of Haiyan, survivors had no water, food or shelter and little possibility of immediate help. Some affected places were so remote, essential aid was slow to arrive. In the town of Giwan, shopkeeper Susan Tan's store survived the storm, but days later, her business was still destroyed. So on Tuesday, around 8 a.m., um, I saw a lot of people here looting my place already, and um, these people are like all walks of life, professionals, um, teachers, and friends of mine who are here to loot also, enjoying the get all you can things for free. And um, that's why I can't do anything but just watch as all my things are going out of the door. <laughs> With so many people desperate for food and water, grocery shops were tempting targets. They bring in sacks, big plastic bags, because they're already anticipating that there will be a big uh, looting spree. And they bring their child, their relatives, to help in cleaning up my uh, shelves.
there were more people here because they were enjoying the wine. Well, I was just like staring at them and then they're just like, you know, half smiling and maybe some may felt like they're kind of guilty in doing it. But they have no choice but just, just join the fun of getting all those things. And so I just didn't say a thing. It wasn't just the shop. Susan has a warehouse nearby, filled to the ceiling with produce. Once it started the looting, um, we just say thank you, Merry Christmas, and <laughs> enjoy the loot. <laughs> so here's the warehouse. This is what's left. I don't know where to begin to clean. Susan has lost everything. For her, and for thousands of others, international relief could not arrive soon enough. Sunrise live at Cebu Military Airfield in the Philippines. The UN warns that help isn't arriving fast enough to help the millions of people still struggling here five days after one of the strongest storms in history. In the first 10 days, the Royal Air Force also delivers over 200 tons of aid. We're carrying freight into the affected areas, medicine, food, water, doctors to help out or people who are staying in the areas to help the people there. And then from the areas who are taken out, locals who've been affected by the typhoon. A lot of it's devastated really, especially up the coast towards Tacloban and out to, to Kiwan to the east. Uh, just everything around the airfield themselves have been flattened. On the 25th of November, the British aircraft carrier HMS Illustrious arrives laden with supplies, including 100 tonnes of rice purchased in Singapore. The main thing that we can provide is a large amount of airlift. We've got seven helicopters on board. In one lift, we can land personnel and up to a tonne of equipment. Uh, now, obviously, a tonne of rice will then go to feed you know, 30, 40 people for two weeks or more people for less. And that's what we're aiming to do here, is to plug that gap um, between what they've got now and what they will need to then get their lives back on track. Helicopters flying from a carrier can cover a wide area and all kinds of terrain. The affected population is spread over many islands, and illustrious can be directed to the areas most in need. With boats smashed by the typhoon and roads impassable, these helicopters can reach communities otherwise completely cut off. It's not just the military involved in the relief effort. Aid organisations were quick to arrive in Tacloban. Kat Carter has worked for Save the Children in many of the world's worst disaster zones. Ivan is very, very handsome. Health clinics are overwhelmed and desperately in need of support. At first they stayed at home, but when their roof flew off, they transferred to another house. She had her two smaller kids with her and they were crying. They're extremely worried about their children and not having enough food to eat. So her biggest fear is actually that the food is going to run out um, and that she won't have anything left. She said that her husband used to be a farmer. His crops have all been destroyed. She simply doesn't know what they're going to do for food. So she's really worried about that. Bethany Hospital in Tacloban saw a flood of patients. Nurse Paolo Pardilla worked tirelessly to save lives, but had no idea if his own family were dead or alive. 
I have no communication with them because the cellular phones, the, the link of communication was shut down. But I was just praying that my family was safe. Paolo spent 24 hours helping in the hospital. And then he walked to his home in a village on the outskirts of the city. It took him a day. There was no transport. Everything was in ruins. He had no idea what he would find. To his relief, all was well at his mother's home. This is the first time in my life. This is the, a strong, the strongest storm I, I ever experienced. Paola's brother's family lived next door. They weren't so lucky. It was that fourth tree, the big branch of that was able to fell on the, the house of my brother. My daughter was so scared. So we ran out and go to our mother's house. My mother's house. The concrete walls of Paolo's mother's house withstood the fierce winds of Haiyan, but they were no protection against the storm surge. Flood waters rushed through the house, and for eight hours, the family huddled together on the steps. Sit down here, my granddaughter, my uh, daughter-in-law here, my husband standing. Uh, holding the ceiling because it might fall to us. Oh, we just keep on uh, praying, Lord, please save us. Uh, please save also my son, Paolo, in Bethany, because uh, I am very much worried for my son because the hospital, Bethany Hospital, is near the sea. Paolo's family all survived. But when the typhoon had passed, the city of Tacloban was a disaster zone. Whole neighborhoods were left barely recognizable. You cannot see many of the houses there because it's covered with uh, foliage, like uh, trees and uh, leaves. But now you could see even that mountain <laughs> at the end. Now it's all gone. The Philippines is subject to volcanoes, earthquakes, flooding, landslides. But at the same time, it is a socially vulnerable place with many, many people living in extreme poverty. The Philippines is a poor country. For the majority of its 98 million people, Providing food and shelter, clothing and education take priority over preparing for disaster. This poverty forces the majority of Filipinos to live in the country's most vulnerable areas, on the coast. In many developing countries, there is no choice. If you want to support your family and yourself, you have to live near the coast. You are forced to remain in place even in these high hazard zones. High winds, even typhoons, are a fact of life for those living along the Philippines' 20,000 miles of coastline. But even they were completely unprepared for the huge surge of water of a super typhoon. Why so much dead, so much casualty with this typhoon? The media, the local media, even our own weather center, underestimated the surge. They were only monitoring the direction of the of this typhoon, the speed, and the, the strength, but never mentioning about the surge. That's the, one of the reasons they were confident they were staying at home, because they, were, they, are, they, not, not, they do not know what is a storm surge. <laughs> they could have evacuated. Mandatory evacuation for all the people living in the sea line one or two kilometers inland. But the thing, it did not happen. So they said that uh, during the typhoon, they were actually here, they did not evacuate 
they were here in this, uh, there are three families inside. And when the surge came in, destroyed the house and split them up. And in the process, they lost a lot of their family members. The mother? The mother, my three children, and the two children of my sister. The priority now is to help survivors. Hello. Aid workers like Kat Carter work round the clock to get aid to the more remote villages. Wherever they go, crowds appear, eager for any help they can get. Has there been any tarpaulin distributed to this village? There's no one who's given tarpaulin. No, not at all. Okay. It's quite common that we'll turn up to a distribution and lots of people will turn up saying they need other things. Uh, of course, it's always a bit distressing because you, you think, oh, how are we, how are we ever going to do enough? Okay. Hey. Okay, thank you all so much for talking to me. Thank you. Thank you. We've not done this side yet. Okay, are we coming to this side? Possibly. Okay, good. That's what I just Most said. Most affected is on the coast, so we start on the coast and then we work out. The homes of these people, they've been completely destroyed. Their livelihoods, so the shops that they had, the farms, they've been destroyed. The water isn't clean if it's running at all. There's no food because, again, the crops have been destroyed. Lots of the food stores will have been destroyed by that storm surge that came through and contaminated everything. Uh, the schools aren't open because they're still covered with debris. Uh, in terms of needs, huge, absolutely huge. In the days after Typhoon Haiyan devastated the Philippines, the scale of the destruction became clear. It's estimated that over 5,500 people lost their lives. Another 26,000 were injured. I'd come down walking just a few days after I arrived and I looked out over the, uh, over the ocean as we were walking and I remember seeing, um, seeing a boat out on the, on the sea and thinking for a second that, you know, oh, that's great, you know, they're, they're fishing again. It's a sign of resilience. Look how quickly they've, you know, they, they've got past the disaster. And it took a little while, I think, for, um, for my brain to kind of catch up with what my eyes were seeing and then I realised that they weren't fishing, they were pulling dead bodies from the water. And I kind of carried on looking around and all along the beach, um, they'd lined up dead bodies uh, and lots of them were children. And that was kind of the moment for me that the enormity of what, of what had happened here kind of came crashing down around me. The death toll from Typhoon Haiyan is still rising. Nearly 2,000 people remain missing. For those who survived, life will never be the same again. With his home blown away, Carlito Arias found himself desperately holding on to his children as the sea surge came rushing in. <laughs> Yun ang, yun ang pinakamasakit na hindi ko na sila na proteksyonan. Once the storm passed, Carlito searched for his children. One by one, he found their bodies. With no organized help to hand, Carlito was then left with the task of building a grave for those he lost. Sinabi ko sa kanila yung nalaman ko doon sa bayan. No wala na tayong ibang magagawa kundi ang ilibing natin balutin na lang natin ng banig. The burial was swift. No time for the usual embalming and coffins. The bodies were laid to rest all together in a sacred place. May pasimento namin doon. Para may pakita ko naman sila sa kanila na
Carlito has always been a jack of all trades. Carpenter, mechanic, driver, and plumber. Good with his hands. But that's not how he sees it now. Kasi kahit hindi ko pinag-aralan, nagagawa ko. Pero yung pitong buhay, dito na wala. Hawak ko kasi sila dyan eh. Nung inaanod ako, wala na. Wala nang nagawa itong kamay ko. Aside from the human cost, over a million homes have been damaged, and half of those were completely destroyed. Georgina Bulasa and her husband are just two of nearly four and a half million people left homeless. That is my husband, building a house, a very simple one. He's just using whatever is usable now. Besides, we do not have the money to buy materials, and there is no uh, store that is open. So me and my husband is hoping that in due time we will be able to to start uh, start anew again. Across the country, countless small businesses have been ruined. Around five million workers have temporarily or permanently lost their livelihood. Susan Tan, whose grocery shop was looted, has now become involved in a local aid distribution charity. She is happy to see her shop space being put to good use again. So here I am, instead of a grocery store, this became a relief center. So food has returned to the shop, this time as aid. Susan doesn't know what the future holds, but neither the typhoon nor the looting has put her off thinking of starting all over again. Maybe we will try one more time and see how it goes. Nurse Paolo is also putting his efforts into helping those affected by the typhoon. With Taclaban's hospital flooded, relief workers have set up an inflatable medical center. What's new in the last two days for us is that there's a feeling of joy, of hope in our lives, especially for us nurses, because we can continue our work. Today, our hospital is not yet opening or not yet in service, so the 10th hospital is a means for us to continue rendering care and service to the people, especially those affected by the typhoon. Ate, your, your medicines, ibang medicine, ibuprofen, amoxicillin dito kamapila, ha? Okay. We're going to see waves of fatalities. There's the immediate deaths from drowning and or being hit by uh, objects in the tremendous winds that they were experiencing during the typhoon. But then there's going to be secondary deaths related to infections, contagion, tetanus, typhoid, and then a third wave of people with chronic illness who now can't get their medication for heart disease or high blood pressure or whatever, whatever else it might be. As the Filipino people attempt to deal with the immediate aftermath of the typhoon, the analysis begins. The experts are agreed. Rising sea levels played a key part. It's why the storm surge was so deadly. As the oceans warm, they expand and make for a rising sea level. And a rising sea level makes these storms far more dangerous because it puts that many more people at risk with the storm surge. It's not going to take as powerful a storm surge to create the damage we saw from Haiyan if sea level is one or two feet higher 50 years from now. So the vulnerability of our coastal communities that are traditionally or historically in the path of these storms is only going to get worse just from sea level rising, let alone the fact that we ha may have more of these storms or more powerful storms. We might be tempted to think in the developed world, well, you know, if that same storm hit America, Britain, the consequences would have been a lot less. I don't think so. 
if that storm had hit the southeastern U.S. Uh, that was so powerful that I think it would have been as much a disaster and ep economically a lot more of a disaster just because there's so much more stuff there. The Filipino government currently puts reconstruction costs at around 3.6 billion pounds. In the affected areas, key industries such as agriculture and fishing have all but been destroyed. For the people on the ground, it would be easy to be overwhelmed, but the job now is to rebuild. We do have no plan to go elsewhere, but to stay here and rebuild whatever we can, because this is our home. No place like sweet home. The priority for Father Hector is his parish. Christmas is not far away. This is a religious community, and for many, the church is needed more than ever. We always have that uh, strong spirit to rebuild in our own little way, in our own simple way. We don't have a roof for, on our head, but the thing is, they would do their best to celebrate that Mass. And I, I believe they would be coming in to be grateful to God for their lives. Paano na to? Pang, panggastos lang pambili ng mga unti-unti dito. Wala, wala talaga tayong pera. Yan ang gagawin natin. We're hoping. That big hope. <laughs> that uh, um, slowly we are going to make it back to normal again. Kuya, marami pang nagmamahal sa iyo. Alam namin, nararamdaman namin yung nararamdaman mong sakit. <laughs> Sabi nila, huwag ang susuko. Hindi ako susuko. Hindi ako susuko. Nalaban ako. It's a tradition for Filipinos that they never give up. In spite of all these disasters, in spite of all the tragedies, they won't give up. We lost a lot of lives, and that's a fact that we have to accept and to live with. It will take some time. It's part of our culture that in spite of all the, the pain, the sufferings that we have endured, they are still smiling. <laughs>